and welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Olivia Pleaker, Senior Content Producer and Editor of the Booktopian blog, and joining me today is Ben Hunter, Booktopia's Resident Fiction Specialist. Um, our guest today is someone we're very excited to chat to. He is the multi-award winning, best-selling author of a little book called Boy Swallows Universe, one that's just hit the 500,000 copy sales milestone in Australia, and whose latest novel coming in late September is A True Australian Odyssey, um, one of curses, secrets, gifts, and true love called All Our Shimmering Skies. We are thrilled to welcome Trent Dalton onto the podcast today. Welcome, Trent. Oh, uh, Liv, thank you so much for having me. Great to see you, Ben. And uh, guys, that's beautiful. The way you just said that, and you kind of made that whole 500,000 thing real, Liv, saying it out loud. I've only seen it in print and <laughs> not really heard a human being actually say it. And that's pretty amazing to hear that number. It's, a, it's an unreal number to it's think about, It's an unbelievable Trent. number. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, do you guys remember? Like ben and I were talking before the podcast, and he was saying that like most authors dream of ten thousand, let alone yeah. five hundred thousand. Oh, so. I remember going to the Booktopia warehouse. I swear to God, it, it was the first time I'd seen a multitude <laughs> of those books put together, right? And it was a massive block. It felt like a big castle of books. And and I asked Ben, I asked someone, you know, how many it was, and it was maybe I don't know. For, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but I felt like it might have been around five hundred or something sitting yep. on that table at Booktopia. And I turned to Alice from HarperCollins, who was sort of taking me around Sydney that day. And I, Imagine if we sold all of those books, like all of those analysis, like, oh, look, they probably wouldn't get you to sign them if they don't think they can sell them. And I'm like, really? You reckon they're going to sell all those? You know, it's just nuts. It's nuts to think that, yeah, like it's like a thousand times that now. And anyway, that like, that, I mean, so... Honestly, just that's how much I expected anything like that, you know, back then. So, yeah, it's sort of kind of nice to be talking to you guys right now as uh, with that milestone. Yeah, on the, on the other side of that, Trent, um, you've been so vocal in, in your humbleness and your gratitude to everyone for all the support. You know, everyone who's, everyone from booksellers to people in publishing, just to, to readers that have just championed this book that you put together and, you know, you've, you've said so many times, you know, I put my heart and soul into this book uh, and it means the world to me. Um, but I want to ask you the hard question on the other side of it all now, all of that success, what is it about that book that you think took off with readers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Great question. Um, if I really, you know, I have had a lot of time to think about it and, and a, a lot of time go to events and talk to just, general people who come up and you know they'll people get really emotional about that book mate and um and you know m more than i kind of do in some ways weirdly because i feel like i've processed a lot of the emotion from it in the doing of it and um and but when they come up and they just say they say that the recurring thing is is thank you for this because it gives me hope and i know that sounds so cheesy to say but, you know, thank you for this because it, it reminds me of my situation. But I never had the reminder that it was good. And, uh, and so I feel the universal thing about that book, whilst it's a very um, specific uh, location of Australia, Dara, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, or Brackenridge, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, basically two halves where the kids go in that book, are both kind of pretty rough kind of neighborhoods of Brisbane and, but you know, in those houses in the, in the, in the brown brick housing commission home that Eli and Gus and, and therefore the home that the Dalton boys grew up in um, that there was that thing called hope and that, that sense of humor and sense of love. And it's just all those great things that reminded me, Oh yeah, right, right. We all have that universal thing. And, 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 you know, so if there's one thing I feel that, maybe kept the momentum of that thing going was that it did have hope and and i was so glad glad back well oh, well man i mean i'm so glad i wrote it at 38 because if i wrote it at 20 it would have, wouldn't have had any hope you know and and um and so it's really interesting it has the whole second half of that book is built around hope and that's been the whole second half of my life the whole second 20 years has been meeting my wife and having two kids who bring me like profound oh and so you know, hope's one of those really, like, it's a beautiful word and it's a really strong word, but it, and it can be used in a really cheesy way. But I, I, I do think you can throw something like hope in a, in a book that is, you know, predominantly pretty dark and got some pretty wild things. And, you know, man, I, you know, um, 
you know, it was a phantasmagoria, you know, who the great, the great Ben Hunter, you know, just blew my mind. I'm talking early, early, like days into the journey of Boy Swallow Universe, kind of so perfectly you described that, Ben, in, a, in a one of your amazing Booktopia reviews. And I just sort of went, wow, man, he's right. And then, and it, and it is hard to sort of, it's a hard book to sell, like in the, in the terms of, okay, what it's, what's it about? It's a kid who finds a secret room beneath, you know, the man he, he loves bedroom and inside that secret room is a red telephone. And, and the person on that phone has some things to say about the meaning of life in that boy's direction. And then the kid busts into women's prison to save his mum's life on Christmas day. And that's all a bit long. And, but you know, maybe two years on, you hand it to someone just go, Oh, look, it's about hope. It's a book about hope. You know what I mean? That's all you have to know, you know? And so, you know, and that's what I sort of, that's sort of where I'm at with it now. And so I'm really, if I see that figure and I go, man, that's so sweet that that many people might've read that message and, and kind of felt, you know, I oh, yeah, got that, got that realization. You know, and God, man, like, you know, look at where we're at now in pandemics and stuff. And that whole thing about it gets good is hopefully a sort of thing we're all trying to remember as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. And it's safe to say that with this big, beautiful celebration of hope that your novel, is, uh, that Big Boys Falls Universe is, um, I think it's safe to say that expectation is pretty high for um, all our Shimmering Skies. Is that, yeah. was that at the forefront of your mind at all while you were writing it? <laughs> Oh, Silly Liv, question, um, oh, no, no, it's so funny. Like, it's like, I, I tried, I kidded myself, like I, in the writing I, and I, and I, and I do genuinely believe this, right. I really believe it to be true that everything that happened in Boy Swallows universe, like it's a fact, mm -hmm. right. When I was in grade six, Mrs. Garside at Brighton state school, which is kind of the suburb next to Brackenridge. I went to primary school there for a bit and, um, and, and, you know, my dad went to her parent teacher night and Mrs. Garside pulled my dad aside and goes, Mr. Dalton, we're terrified. Your son is going to become the leader of an outlaw motorcycle gang. And, uh, and dad came home from that. He's like, what the bloody hell are you doing at that school? To get this woman to, to believe these things. And what I'm trying to say is like that whole Boy Swallows universe thing was just ridiculous in the sense it wasn't meant to happen. It wasn't sort of meant to be in my destiny. And um, so therefore I kept telling myself that when I sat down to write all our shimmering skies and that like Trent, it doesn't matter because this is all gravy, right? This is all just cherries on top. And so I really kind of convinced myself that that is true. And it's like, oh, I don't even care. So I'm just going to write something like back to square one. You're the luckiest bugger on earth. So don't ever forget it. And um, so all bets are off and, and you don't, you don't owe yourself anything anymore. You don't owe anyone else anything. Just write freely, man. And just, um, and, and, swing for the fence right like try and hit a six and uh and but then as i talk to you guys now i'm like scared to death about how this thing's gonna do it's so ridiculous so so in the writing of it i'd really convinced myself that like it doesn't matter like all bets are off don't worry trent but now that it's kind of really close to you know it's sort of it's about to hit and it's about to whatever you know it's gonna go out into the world um i'm petrified so i, I don't know what what I'm, i don't know why and when when during the writing of it I wasn't worried at all because it was just me in Brisbane and I'm down in my little bunker and, and I was just sort of riding away and I didn't, you know, so it's, it's really strange, the emotions that you, you go through and, and, and people were sending me emails though. And, like, and I wasn't even thinking about this stuff. People were sending me emails like, Trent, just be, be braver, right? And don't, you don't have anything to prove. And I'm like, no, no, I wasn't thinking that. I wasn't thinking that people were telling me all this stuff, like you should be petrified. And then, but I'd managed to sort of just pass that aside for a bit and just really, plunge into this story once i once i got the story that i was really proud of and really loved i was just like no nah, i can go forth and just do this without and the big thing is 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 buying into that stuff would would be giving myself an inflated sense of elevation that i'm not worthy of because i really think i was really lucky and that boy swallows universe was the story i was perhaps put on earth to tell but it was from, you know, a lot of deep, dark stuff and real life stuff in that. And so I got really lucky that life gave me that story. That was my inheritance. You know, that story, it was my inheritance from kind of all sorts of dark stuff and beautiful stuff as well. But I'm not worthy of any feeling of like, oh, you're this or, you, or that people would expect you to be some genius writer because I'm just not. And uh, so it was sort of like, all right, so now go try and become a better writer. And like, that was okay. It's going to be just like, it generally felt like it kind of 
It was my second feature piece and I was a 21 year old feature journalist and I'd just done one, you know, it feels like that. Like that's how I felt. Anyway, but so sorry to, for the long answer, Liv. It's just, I'm excited. I'm excited to talk to you, actually. This is why I'm like doing these rambling answers because this is like the first interview I've done for this book. But it's like, so it's really cool to look back and go, okay, what has the past two years been and where's this thing going now? But yeah, so it's a totally great question because, man, the emotions were huge and they are right now. So I'm only feeling that kind of in the past couple of weeks. Like similar how I felt in Voice Fuller's Universe. I just got, like, I got physically ill, like, when Voice Fuller's Universe was coming out. I got, like, yeah, like, that whole period I was down at, with you guys at Booktopia, like, I was I was hopping in the cabs and stuff and just, like, you know, fluttering into bloody tissues and stuff because I was, a, you know, a ball of them, physical and a wreck almost. But, uh, you know, that's publishing, I guess. <laughs> I think you're having this, this, this really visceral emotional response because you've created something that you really love. And you mm. and you 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 oh. care for it like a parent. Would you oh. agree? Oh, Ben, that's beautifully said, man. Yeah, no, and thank you for saying so, like for reminding me of that because it's true. Like, I, like I, I I started kind of crying when I was writing the last pages of that book, you know, and and things that happened to the characters. Like that's how much I was into it, you know. And not I know that sounds a bit dicky, but it's like it's true. Like I'd really fallen in love with these characters, and I'm I'm kind of in love with Molly Hook now kind of more than Eli Bell, like that, that beautiful kid as my, and you know, he's kind of me, that kid, but I had to sort of just get over myself a bit and just, all right, kid, move out because there's this other really important kid that needs a bit of, I don't know, uh, guidance and kind of bit, bit of care or something. And so it was sort of, yeah. And so, and so I, I would have been genuinely crushed and I will be, if, you know, and, and if, if someone doesn't embrace that girl, <laughs> The way I I have, you know, and and I guess you're, you're exactly right. You and probably even more so because you're so defensive of these people that you think are really beautiful, and and um, they are truly of myself because in some ways so the characters in Boys the Universe were kind of half my mom and half my dad mm. and half my beautiful brothers. So it's sort of like these are all just me and uh, or facets of myself and actually facets of my own. Mm orders so sort of like i'm pretty really defensive of them characters well let's let's meet bolly hook um yeah black right. boys yeah. Wallace universe all our shimmering skies is is all of these different elements trent brought together and you commit to everyone wholeheartedly oh, great. um you got this book that's wild guns are blazing adventure um but at the same time it's bleeding heart romance and at one moment it's realist historical wartime fiction and the next, it's mind-bending fantasy. Uh, oh, wow. How do you describe this book? Yeah, I just like that. That's brilliantly put. <laughs> I mean, that's it. I mean, it, it, it is an absolute reflection of my belief in enthusiasm, the concept of enthusiasm. Like, like I truly believe it's a really important thing for human life. Like, you should be enthusiastic about the people you love and you should be enthusiastic about the birds you see in the sky and the music you listen to and on the record player and in the books you read, you know, and the books you bloody write, you know, and the words you write. So, all right. Oh, you know, I wanted to write, I'm just going to write a bloody full tilt, hundred percent enthusiastic invent adventure. All right. I want to write a love story throw in there. All right. It's going to be as full tilt deep and kind of full of love and romance and kind of the wonder of, of lost love and, and true love and newfound love as well. And, and then, so it's going to have dark parts. So they're going to be so freaking dark as well. Like there's moments in that my wife is reading that book and just going, Oh man, what is wrong with you? Like what, what is in your head? You know? And I'm like, I'm sorry, but if you're going to go dark, go there because again, that was sort of, you know, even the first 20 years of my life in the dark times were dark, you know, you sort of see some dark shit you see some beautiful stuff as well. And so it's all that, but the way I describe it, I have been just saying love story and, and, um, and because I do think it's a story, it's a love story about a girl. All she, she wants is love and to be loved. And, um, and then it's, well, oh, and that's the same to be said, that's the same for Molly and it's the same for Greta as well. The two real heroes of the story. And, and it's the same for Yukio as well. Probably the three main characters of the piece, it, they all function on this kind of, lack of or need of love and so it's a love story and it's a love story about my love of australia too and and 
the bizarre sort of things I've seen along various journeys as a journo and all that sort of stuff too. So, so all of that just comes from love. And so, okay, if, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to amp it up to a, you know, 11 and kind of just go, let's do this. We're going to do it. Let's do it like as, as big and as kind of boldly as we can. And, um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a love story just steeped in my absolute love of story though as well you know so it's like i just wanted to write a big tribute to the whole concept of story as well like just you know things like the odyssey that are in my dna as a kid and and that like we're in my brothers and i i've got three older brothers you know all we did as boys whilst you know there's all this crazy stuff that's in voice Waller's universe and all the drugs and all that stuff well really we were out with cardboard swords pretending we were, you know, fighting Usa. You know, like it's like, you know, it that 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 was the making of us boys. And so it's a bit of a tribute to that too. So it's sort of um but man, you're so right. It's it's just a mixture of so many different things. But ultimately it's a love story. Sorry to answer your question. Your great question. Um I think you've encapsulated it so well and I think that love of story really does come through. Um but I kind of just want to keep talking about Molly Hook. Yeah, um, please, I really please. enjoyed Voice of the Universe. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Like, if you haven't read it by now, what is wrong with you? Uh, but I really connected with All Our Shimmering Skies on a level that, like, I wasn't expecting. And oh, I think that it is down to wow. Molly. Oh, oh. thank you. That's so beautiful to hear. That's so beautiful. Yeah, I remember talking to Ben um, in front of our what passes for a water cooler at Booktopia's HQ. And he was like, so have you read it? What did you think? And I was like, I really loved it. I think I like it more than Boys Falls Universe. And I think it's down to Molly because she's such a fantastic character. She's this young girl, like haunted by her mother's parting words and her legacy. And she's also just scrambling to put together a life and figure out what kind of woman she wants to become. Yeah. All under the thumb yeah. of this horrible, abusive uncle and her father who's not really present with her. So I kind of just want to know a little bit more about where she came from and how the experience of writing her and creating her, like Molly, because she's a young girl, you know, compared yeah, to writing yeah. Eli. Like, uh, can you Liv, share a bit more about that? Yeah, it's, it's such a great question because I was really conscious of just doing a, of, of not doing like a female Eli Bell, you know, like, like just sort of going like, and I was really conscious like, oh, can I even do that again? Like another, but it just had to be the story just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and and molly just became more and more defined the real genesis if i'm really going to go back my i've got this young daughter so i've got two daughters <laughs> beth and sylvie and and the youngest um sylvie is 11 and and she comes back from um you know it's like sort of book day or something and one of the teachers go oh you know your, your dad wrote that boy swallows universe book and and it's quite funny for sylvie because some of the parents at school have probably read that book and they start looking at like my mom on grandparents day and stuff. And they're going, oh, I think she inspired that book. And I think she like went out with all these drug dealers in the eighties stuff, but she's just this really sweet grandmother. Now my mom who goes to a grandparent day and stuff. And anyway, around that time, Sylvie comes home and she's like, Oh dad, everyone's talking about this book, Boy Swallows Universe at school. And cause I hadn't sort of really, I told the girls the story of Boy Swallows, you know, sat them down even before the whole thing was going to happen and go, Hey, look, um, I think it's time, you know, that there's all this stuff in your grandma's past and my past and all that. And it's like, just be ready. And I'm sorry that it, you know, if you do hear things about that, that perhaps are mm. negative or something, but just, you know, be ready and don't worry because we're really proud of everything and um, it'll be really cool. And it could actually do something. It could actually be something beautiful that is put into the world because of all that stuff. Anyway, so but that uh, Sylvie comes home one day and she goes, Dad, so Boy Swallows Universe is about these two beautiful boys, Eli and August, these two brothers. And she goes, but you're, you're like a father of two girls. And, uh, and uh, you know, why, why don't you write something about two beautiful girls? And I was like, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, it's like, you know, who, who am I to write about, you know, two, two girls or, the, or, the, or the com- a coming of age story about a girl, essentially. But you know what? that's probably what I know more than any human being right now, because I obsess over these two girls of mine. And, and so that was a really powerful kind of, you know, I just, I have, to, I just have to write from like a very deep emotional place. Like I realize that I realize that now and I'm doing the same thing on my third book now, just like, man, just not nah, just write from emotion, you know, just write from the thing that you will know, you just put your heart and soul into it. And it's like, 
that's how I wrote Boy Swallows Universe and just being sort of honest. And I thought, why wouldn't I write about that? Those that uh, about girl, a girl that age, because right now that's what is consuming my heart and soul. And so that was a really good start point. Then I got thinking about graveyards. I started thinking a lot about, a lot about graveyards. I've always wanted to set a story in a graveyard because I'm this weirdo who does genuinely like I, I've done a series of journal journalism pieces where I just walk through graveyards and tap, like it's so kind of weird, but you just tap someone on the shoulder and go, you know, who are you, who are you here to see? Tell me the story. I'd love to hear that. If you've got an hour to talk, I'll listen to the person who's in the grave there. I'd love to hear that story. And they tell you and it's deeply beautiful. And so um, I'd love this idea of this girl perhaps um, finding friends in, in epitaphs, you know, and, and uh, I thought, wow, that could be something really cool. And um, then I, then I thought about, okay, who is that kid? Um, where does this thing begin? And, and could we start at the worst moment? Could we start a tale at the worst moment in that person's life? So, so, well, yeah, okay. How old would she be? She'd probably be 12 if that thing happened around then. And that would be the worst thing. And so then, I don't know. And then suddenly, you know, I really am one of those deep believers in just trying to make, trying to find our kind of character through hardship, I guess. And I'm not, I hate to keep bringing it back to myself, but it's like, if the things I've learned is how I've behaved in the hard times. And so, okay, I'll throw this poor kid into a lot of hard stuff. And so then suddenly her old man starts a bit more of a picture of them. And, and you know what, Liv, like, to be honest, I'm just kind of, I don't, I tried to run away from some of the themes of Boy Swallows Universe in the sense of, um, you know, just some of the kitchens that Molly finds herself in, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with those kitchens at, at that time of hour, if that makes sense, you know, and, and, and so I, I think it's kind of my responsibility to write about those kitchens, you know, in some ways, I just think if I can write about it, maybe I should, you know, and, and not, and not, I, 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 to be honest, I ran away from that. Like I, I was trying to run from Boy Swallows Universe and going like, oh, hang on, you know, maybe I'll just go write about medieval knights or something. And, um, but then you just go, nah, man, what am I here for? You know, like I'm, I'm here to perhaps, you know, the too many bloody 14 year old high school students were writing to me going, thank you so much for writing about this world of mine and, and just going, well, man, okay. You know, maybe I do have more to say about those type of kitchens or that type of world. And um, even though it's 1942 bombing of Darwin, I'm still, exploring things that I haven't sorted out in the own, in my back of my own mind, you know, and, and I'm talking now, I'm talking about things like people I've lost and genuinely um, the, well, genuinely DNA curses that, that of things that I worry about as a 41 year old father um, of my own kids. And so you see those fathers in that book and I, you know, that's a lot of me trying to analyze myself and, and analyze people in my own DNA, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm really fascinated with that concept of genetics and, and, and the curses that are carried down through blood. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, like, you know, heavy drinking and stuff, things that I have to really be careful of. And so that can, that can, that can kind of feel like a curse sometimes, you know, so another, you know, and so, you know, okay, well, what if, what if there's a kid like Molly trying to analyze something like that that she's seen in a family you, you would think it's an actual curse you know you you don't know that you, know, you don't know the science of that or you might think god damn so it feels like, it feels like there's so much misfortune in my family it feels like we are cursed and you know so that's pretty all deep stuff and it's sort of like um i thought that's powerful stuff to mine and so i wanted to again mine it through a complete um innocent like molly hook um who is uh you know just this girl that Kind of is, um, I, I really love your scouts of the world and your, you know, just these kids who I'm totally hooked on that kind of idea that, um, that kids can get through anything and, and, and they will process trauma in such beautiful and magnificent way. So who better to take us on this journey than a girl who's really processing her, her own baggage. But, um, but you know, I, it's, it's the stuff it's, and I'm also trying to tap into Sorry, you've asked like two questions and we're like half an hour in. I'm such a douchebag. I'm sorry. But, uh, but, um, but it, it's because it was such a great question, Liv. And because uh, it taps into the heart of like, I love that you love Molly Hook because I do too. And, and I'm trying to tap into the wonder of the wells 
of love and hope that my daughters have, which I just go, God damn, man, they haven't been tainted with the curse, you know, like they're just so freaking pure. And it's like, how does, how does a kid like that do that? And so why don't write a character like that? And can she stay pure by the end of this journey and, uh, and not be tainted by the curses that she feels are around her. And so suddenly you'll throw all of that in and then throw in some real, real cool stuff about kind of like badass girls, you know, and just be badass and just try and get through this and don't and live your life. And, and you know what, you feel like you've got a curse. Well, go change your fate, you know? And, and that's cool. Like that's just, maybe I wrote, I've dedicated that book to my daughters and my wife and, and who's who, whose spirit they have in spades. And so it's like, hell yeah, read that and, and go, you know, go change your fate if you ever are struggling with anything. And so suddenly, you know, so to hear you say you're like Molly, it's like the, the, um, it's a beautiful girl, Ruby, um, who, um, is doing the audio book. And she just sent me this massive, like, massive thing she was talking about how she just finished doing the audio version of of all our sharing skies and she's going Trent, this is like some sort of femi- feminist manifesto or something and it's like totally wasn't my intention but she's just like it's so freaking empowering and i'm so freaking how so touched that she said that and i'm so touched live that you connect to molly like that it certainly wasn't my intention to write it that way but i'm just going go for it kid keep going keep going and that's stuff I would hope my daughters would feel. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, that's why I love Molly too. I just think she's, she's utterly like, she's totally my hero. And I just, yeah, by the end, I'm just going, wow, you're a freaking amazing kid. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Hmm. Oh man. And just this beautiful relationship she shares with Greta as well. Um, just they're both kind of struggling and they don't have that female like that motherly figure in their life that will to guide them necessarily you know Eli had um yes. Slim and and she's they've just kind of found each other and made they go out and they do find their fates together and I just think that's incredible like the way oh. that their story kind of unfolds without spoilers I nearly went into spoilery territory there no but. oh that's lovely you say it and I, I love that the fact yeah and I you know again I'm conscious of that is I was sort of all through it going oh is Greta just slim again like am I and I'm just really conscious of Greta isn't equipped to be Yoda for her eh? because Greta mm-hmm. is, you know, trying to find her own, she's do- sorting her, s- her own stuff out. You can't be slim if you're slim got sent to prison for 30 years and got time to sort himself out and came out able to be so wise and give Eli all that great advice. But, um, yeah. but Greta has not got that capacity. And um, I loved Greta finding that capacity along the way. And I think that's really, that was really you know, I just, if that came across in that. I just, I mean, I love Greta and I, you know, Greta's such an amazing kind of Genesis because I love um, Madonna in 1985, like basically, you know, Madonna, like the singer Madonna. Mm-hmm. 1985 Madonna is just the coolest human being who ever existed. And um, I always thought I'd love to write her into a book somehow, like just that sort of just that um, sassy, just ass kicking kind of no nonsense, just um, woman. Mm-hmm. And uh, mixed with kind of one of those kind of great 1940s kind of starlets and who were just chain smoking and drink hard drinking and just seen it all. And I love those kind of women who, you know, like Australia was just built on those women. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, I've got to really sort of capture some of that in, in, in this book as well. And so I'm really glad that sort of Greta becomes like, you know, she is, she is the doer in that book. Like she's really you know, Yukio is a bit of a doer as well, but man, it's Greta who really gets shit done. And, um, and I'm really proud of her for doing so. Yeah. And it's like, but I just love dynamics like that of two people completely lost in this world and not realizing that all that they're looking for is each other. And uh, that's a very powerful thing in storytelling that I love is, is just that thing of, man, I don't know what I'm looking for and, and looking for it with that and looking for it on a journey with someone, a total stranger and realizing on the way, oh shit, all I was looking yeah. for was you. Yeah, that's that's a really cool thing. Mm. Trent, tell us about your obsession with Darwin and the <laughs> bombing of Darwin in, in February 1942. Yeah, thanks, man. Great question. Like, um, first time, first place I ever flew, first plane I ever hopped on was to Darwin. And um, it was for a story for um, my first ever journalism gig uh, at the age of and uh, we flew to Darwin. I was just writing a story about, it was a travel story on Darwin. 
And there I went, um, my first experience with Litchfield National Park, which is this extraordinary kind of um, utopia. It's only about an hour and a half south of Darwin. And, um, and it is filled with the most magical waterfalls, the most incredible peaks and promontories and, and stone um, landscapes and the most um, suffocating vine forests. And genuinely, um, it's filled with a lost city of stone that um, looked to me like um, bad men frozen in stone. And, um, and I was freaking blown away. You know, termite mounds as, as high as um, treetops. And, you know, just it's prehistoric, that whole place. And it, and it blows your mind. And then only in town is, is, a, is, a, is a city that is obviously, you know, was knocked over by Cyclone Tracy. Before that, um, endured what I consider the most dramatic moment in, in modern Australian history, which was the February 19, uh, 1942 bombing of Darwin, in which 256 people were killed, possibly far more than that. They don't have the correct records on it. Um, and that story, that whole history is still playing itself out in that city. And, um, and that moment 20 years ago when I first visited it was profound for me. And my brother was in the army. Um, he had a baby up in Darwin. I went and visited them again. Went back to Litchfield National Park. Just kept on going back to this park. And, and um, along the way, you know, my brother sort of is into military history as well. And we'd sort of just, just became a thing. It was just like, what was going on here? And how did, how did this happen without warning? And I mean, we knew it was happening, but, you know, they still had very little warning. And, and it was just... <laughs> if you really play the visuals over in your head, you know, a V-shaped fleet of Japanese zero fighters coming across that blue sky of Australia, coming into Darwin. And, you know, you know, many of the townsfolk hadn't evacuated. A lot had, but some were still around. Um, some really brave men still sticking around, ready to, with some warning, ready to sort of poke their guns at the sky, but not really equipped to do so to fight, you know, the force of the, the Japanese Imperial Navy and, just incredible moment in history, but but also at that time is is a frontier town in the 1940s where filled with uh, Burmese, Thais, uh, Filipinos, um, Germans, you know, people from all across the world, multi as multicultural as Australia could ever ever get, and you know, and and it was just remarkable that Darwin sort of was a really great sort of kind of flew the flag for multicultural Australia way before the other biggest cities did. And, and, you know, it all happened. There was like the American wild west at the Northern tip of Australia. And um, so what a place to kind of set a bit of a dramatic story as far as I was concerned. And, and so then, you know, um, I, I sort of got older. I started doing more stories as a journal. I'd keep finding myself going back to Darwin for various dramatic stories. And I'd always return to this Litfield national park, which I'm completely in love with. And, um, more recently, you know, just as fate has it, because I have this theory that the bloody universe just kicks me around like a bully and just kind of pushes me in the back to go to things. And I found myself, um, I got sent to Uluru. So I found myself in, in one kind of space of about six months. It was crazy. Um, I, was, I was sleeping in a swag under the stars at Uluru and dead set. I was in that, that Uluru camping ground and over the fence, I could hear at night dingo. So the dingoes and you know, there's dingoes in that book and I'll say all these things. And if the people listening read my book later, you'll probably be able to pinpoint where these influences came from. And, um, and then a couple of months after that, I got sent to the Flinders Ranges in South Australia and walking on top of these kind of, we heli hiked, they dropped this precarious helicopter drop on the top of this bloody range. Uh, this helicopter dropped us on a space of not much bigger than like a, a squash court. And, uh, and like on this sort of um, precipice kind of terrifying range, and we had to walk across this kind of range top in South Australia. It was completely kind of mind blowing to me and kind of, I'm looking at eagles. There's eagles up in the sky and just these miraculous birds that is just, and we're as high as them by that point. And, and then I'm looking at these dramatic sort of cliff tops. I'm thinking, God, man, imagine, no wonder Hitchcock sets all these settings up on top of freaking mountain tops. And it's like, dramatic all this stuff and and then the big sort of groundbreaking thing i got sent on a yarn this is for the my kind of day job the weekend australian magazine i got sent on a yarn to this place called group island which is 
um, Arnhem Land on the on the coast of Arnhem Land, like as remote as Australia gets, and um, but as beautiful, like just it could not get any prettier than this island. And um, and I was in sort of it got invited on there by this amazing foundation called the Mercado Joseph Disease Foundation. Mercado Joseph Disease. I'll try and tell it quickly. Is this horrendous um, neurodegenerative disease that really just tragically kind of affects the muscles in the body and movement whilst your brain's like all together inside you can't really express yourself and and sort of and it just kind of slowly debilitates you and and but it also is a um carried down through families and there's there's uh you know a family line on group island of indigenous people who are really like one of the highest nucleus of this disease are, are on this island and there on that island, I went for a walk with this incredible bloke named Steve Buckler Waramara, and um, who's just this amazing guy who's essentially, we're deep in the bush, we're deep in the scrub, the most magical scrub you could ever think of. And, um, and he turns to me, starts telling me about how, you know, so I'm not, I'm not getting sort of, I'm not trying to be kind of any exotic at all. He's just, he was very matter of fact about it. He was, he was taught bush magic knowledge by his grandfather and his grandparents and his mother, his parents after that. And they taught him how to use the land and, and, and use certain things on Groot Island to um, perhaps um, cure the MJD disease that he has currently. And so he's currently working with, amazing scientists in Sydney. Um, yeah. Looking for ways to cure his own MJD. Right. And so he said, so I'm on that island and he's telling me this stuff and I'm just getting pretty mystical here, man. I was just going like, wow. Like, and you feel things on that island is, is what I'm trying to say. Right? And I'm, and I, you know, I'm probably too dumb and too white, too suburban Brisbane white to understand the true kind of significance of what you feel on a place like that. But you know, you just feel, good and you just feel pretty deep about stuff and 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 that afternoon i was having a beer on the beach of of this brute island i'd sort of finished enough all the interviews and i'd gone back to my little motel room and i was having a beer at this beach and i look up to the sky and i i'd sort of you know i i've lost my dad like a, a while back but it was just boy swallows universe was going crazy and things were all happening and maybe like it was like people like joel edgerton had been interested in the tv show and i just couldn't believe a lot of stuff like it was just what is going on and i i distinctly remember just looking up at the blue sky and i didn't say it out loud or anything i just sort of i just kind of said to my old man i just said because he's kind of robert bell in boy swallows universe totally right like he's he gives me that Boy Swallows Universe story. That's what he leaves, me, you know, on this planet Earth. It's like, sorry, mate, I don't have any money to give you, but I'll give you this story, right? That's the inheritance. And and I sort of was looking up, just going, can you believe this shit, Dad? Like, wow, hey, like, can you believe it? And um, and you know, obviously, this guy doesn't say anything back or anything, but it's like, um, but it felt good, you know. That that felt really nice, and it just felt like a really nice moment. And I just had this really deep kind of slightly whimsical and profound thought about all the conversations we all have with the sky. And, um, you know, I wonder, I wonder how many times every one of us has said something intimate and kind of important to the sky, someone or something or just themselves or, or just because it's the most beautiful freaking thing above us. And, and I thought, yeah, you know, you don't say a trivial word to the sky. You say, you only say the good stuff and you only say the important stuff. And that, that got really sort of me thinking about, you know, okay, you know, it wouldn't be that surprising if this kid Molly Hook was really the story was really, I'd really had the profound kind of like um, some of the story narrative moments, like the sky gifts that fall from the sky and stuff I'd really had by then. But to the whole idea of the sky really kind of interacting with Molly was really born in that moment. And that was Darwin. That was that, that was Northern Territory that just gave me all that stuff. It was just the power of the place. And then, then I get back to Brisbane and I'm like, um, uh, I've got this story and, um, and I go, uh, I, I sort of say it to my wife <laughs> as she's just doing the laundry and stuff. I tell her this whole story and then uh, she comes out and she's like, you know what, that's a bloody cool story. And then, um, and then I call up this, I just look at, uh, I, I need to put the landscape. I need to get the landscape right. And so then back to Darwin, you know, go back to this, this beautiful place, Litchfield National Park, that is such a huge part of, of what I love about the Australian landscape. And I call this girl up 
Tess Addy and she runs these indigenous tours through Litchfield National Park. And I just tell her the whole story, right? I'm like, oh, there's this kid called Molly Hook and um, I'm writing this book and, and I needed to go. She goes on this quest and because she's trying to, she feels as though she's cursed and she's trying to find the man that she believes has put the curse on her. And, and uh, I needed to sort of just see some beautiful things. And this Tess, man, she just, she just says, Trent, come on up. I'll, I'll show you where she goes. And, and it became this like profound thing. And, and so Tess just takes me on this journey through Litchfield National Park, seeing it in a way that only sort of she could see it. And, it. and it just became this really beautiful kind of thing. So that was it's just all Darwin that I have to thank for that. And so by the end of that trip and Tess and her partner, Greg, and I was loving those two and sort of being so grateful for them. And, you know, Steve Bacala, Waramara, Root. And so just suddenly I'm just going, oh man, well, it has to be all this. I have to write about this place. And that's sort of, yeah. And that's sort of where, it, yeah. So it just, Darwin and is just, I'm so fond of it now. And so hence why, like, I'm, you know, I'm going back there for the Northern Territory Writers Festival. I pray that I'll be allowed in and kind of can get up there. And it's kind of will be like the first proper event. And it's kind of perfect. Like, it'll be really perfect to be able to sort of just talk to those guys and test. And they're going to be there, you know, and, and, um, and mm -hmm. some of some other people, it'll be really cool to sort of just go, hey, you know, this is what came of that. And, and it all just mashes into this, yeah, this thing that is just this wild adventure and it's so many things, but I can't wait for someone like Tess and she's read parts of it and she's like, wow, I, she knew, you know, she goes, yeah, that's cool. Like, she's like, I see what you're doing there. And, you know, and all that, all that sky talk stuff, like I started telling Tess that I'm going like, oh, you know, Molly, she talks to the sky and it was so wonderful to hear Tess hear that stuff. And she goes, yeah, like it was a perfectly normal thing to do. Yep. You know, and all, all of that was really heartening. And so you just go, cool. Yeah. All right. Maybe I'm on the right track with Molly and some of this stuff that's a little bit out, there, but, but someone like Tess goes, no, that's the place. Like, you know, it was almost as if like, God, man, who doesn't do that up here? Like, cause you would, because you see that all the, all the time. The sky is that pretty, you know, up there. So, yeah. I love that you got to go back to that same national park and have that whole other experience well, on top of this layer of history you've had with the place and a personal level, you got to tap into that other ancient culture. Well, Ben, there, there were, there were, there were, uh, I don't want to have any spoilers. One real massive um, answer to one of this, there's a series of riddles in the story that, that, that Molly has to kind of essentially work out along the way. And one of the answers to that riddle is a landscape answer. And it was Tess who pointed it out to me. She's like, yep. oh, what, what do you think that looks like? And I'm like, oh, shit. And, it, and it happens in the book. Almost they show it to Yukio and, and, and they're like, what do you think that looks like? And it's something we all know. And, uh, but it's like it was Tess that showed it to me. We all had a laugh and went, oh, man, I'm going to put that in this book. Yeah, it was just really cool. Little moments like that I, I wouldn't have seen if it wasn't for someone like Tess who's been there thousands of times and gone, you know, this is what that looks like. And, and that, that's a really... Um, yeah, it's a really important thing, but it's also something that I love just on any place I go, just looking at things as though, as though looking at the world is where I get back to this enthusiasm. Thing. Like, you know, what if you looked at the world as if you just landed here, you know, like you're a complete alien and you've just landed here and you have never seen a, um, you've never seen a spider building a web, you know, that would be the most, that would freaking blow your brain. You know what I mean? And so it's sort of like, cool, okay, what if we can walk through this landscape as if we've never seen it before, which is essentially what Yukio is doing too. You know, he, he feels as though, yes. you know, he's, he's landed here and he's going, what the hell is this place? And he can't tell whether it's the plains of high heaven or whether it's the, the North Territory. You know, so, yeah. um, we're running out of time. Oh, Trent, my God. I, oh, my God. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, it's my I'm rambles. just been wrapped in your rambles. Uh, this was, I, I'm, I'm, it's really I'm fun to talk to you I'm just thrilled by really everything great. you have to yeah. say. Oh, um, brilliant. I've, brilliant. Got to, I've got to ask a couple of things that are just Please. burning questions for me. Please. Um, yeah. So even just from the way you've been talking earlier, uh, your work as a journalist, you've spent a couple of decades now collecting stories. Um, yeah. And if it weren't for that, vocation um you know darwin wouldn't have got under your skin the way it oh, has man. um you know what you've been able to do 
and, and oh. it's not just you. It's, 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 a, it's a number of authors that all mm. come from the vocation of journalism yeah. and some of the yeah. best authors working today. You know, a lot of my previous interviews on this podcast have all been journos, you know, Malcolm Knox, Jane Harper. So, yeah, um, yeah. Do you fear that, you know, we might be losing the next generation of storytellers with what's happening to the vocation today? You know, news is being demonetized and the journos themselves are finding themselves politically ostracized in some scenarios. Ben, I just got chills. I, you know what, mate? I didn't even, I had not even stupidly made the connection. It, whenever we look at, at, you know, the really terrible times that journalism is going through right now and we are seeing it like, you know, I've just like last week, like a whole bunch of people I know, like have lost their jobs and, um, I never put together that that would, yeah, because this wonderful thing we're seeing of these journalists sort of taking this little side step into into novels, yeah, that that might, yeah, that might end the sort of, yeah, like where are the storytellers, you know? And so many, I mean, look at Geraldine Brooks, and like, I mean, even there was a, a another previous generation who came out of the world, yep, and uh, you know, so and I'm so proud of that sort of ability to do that, and, and it makes sense if I can just say this. Firstly, it makes sense because all we're trying to do in just a completely non-fiction way is find character and express, especially a long form journalist is just trying to express um, the human condition in as best a way as possible and as truthful as possible. And so all you do for that is to go in to lounge room after lounge room after lounge room across Australia and you ask another human being to sit for four hours and tell you their deepest, darkest secrets. And, and if you're a writer, you learn a lot about human nature that way. And um, so when I read Jane's work or, and I see her amazing descriptions about landscape, I go, yeah, that's because she's bloody driven around Australia looking for yarns. And, you know, and, and I know sometimes she doesn't have to go to some of these places that she writes about, but it's because she's just probably done it and done the hard yards, you know, previously. And, mm -hmm. um, and man, that's such a great point. It's like, I, you know, the, the one, the one sort of thing I, 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 cause I am worried. I think you're so right. And I, and I think what comes at the cost of the degradation of um, the financing of journalism is the something that I believe is essential, but unfortunately isn't seem, doesn't seem essential, which is long form journalism. It's almost a luxury. It's always been a luxury, even to the point where the magazines I write for, we're like laughed at because we get to spend two weeks writing a story. And the news journals just think we're so, you know, we're just this little sort of cared, cared for little lucky group that gets to spend some time crafting their pieces and stuff. But that's a luxury that we're seeing eroded just because of just the nature of the times. And so the people who are telling the stories, you know, the, the person most likely to write a full debrief of COVID, right? What we're going through right now is going to be sometime down the track, someone who's willing to write the long form version of that. And we will have that documented and we'll have that done in a long form way. We can't quite put grasp it in a 500 word news stories all the time, but sometimes there's not now not the money to do that. And then that person who would write that book would then go incorporate that maybe into some incredible novel that speaks of, Australia in 2020, you know, and wouldn't that be like, who's going to do that? And uh, man, you're so right. I really worry. That said, this thing you're doing right now is, is um, never before have we heard more people talking and talking to other humans and uh, in a long form way. And I think the podcast um, medium is our one saving grace on that, in that note, you know, and so hopefully these people who are putting together these amazing 10 part series, you know, but, but, that said too, where do you practice the language? Where do you practice the writing? You know, like I, I got to practice writing on a weekly basis, you know, doing those magazine pieces, just writing good editors, just going, oh, Trent, you don't, you don't put that word before that, or you don't, you know, just genuinely fundamental practical things. And that's another thing The people on the newsroom floor who um, would teach you how to write generally how to be a better writer are, are kind of gone. You know, that's really tough mentor type figures. And, um, and that's really tough. So, um, Man, I just, all I can hope is that, well, and also all these cool places like Vice and sort of, I don't know, these internet type places that allow for 4,000 word features, 
and really dynamic writing too, you know, and then I'm heartened by the fact like the New Yorker will never leave us because the writing's too good, you know? And so fingers crossed, you know, maybe Australia needs a few more of those sort of things maybe, but, um, and you know, things like the monthly are just doing it brilliantly. And, you know, so yeah, I tell you what will never die is story story. And that's, and that's what I keep telling anyone. Like a lot of people go, Oh, you know, should I put my kid into journalism? You know, that my kid's really keen on becoming a journal journalist. And then they go, but I see every day you journos losing your jobs. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's true. We are all losing our jobs, but, um, but, um, stories untouchable, you know, Jack and Jill went ill. And it's like, it's, it's, it's what we do. It's the greatest invention us humans have ever come up with, you know, and, um, we're the only people who can tell you what happens next. And, uh, and it's, that's a very powerful thing. And we forget that, it's like, I get so, you know, it's so laughable how much people tell about Danish furniture. Like just, it's just furniture gets such a, a long, just a good run in our daily conversations and, and restaurants get a good run and, and um, you know, things in our homes and, and, and renovations, but all of that, all of that, all of that stuff only exists so we can come together as human beings and tell more stories together, right? You know, you go to a restaurant to tell stories, not to eat the food. You go, you know, you, you, you sit on a piece of Danish furniture to tell stories with your kids, you know? So it's like, I still have faith that story will never die. And, uh, you know, even though, you know, some forms of journalism are in danger, yeah. if, if not, you know, quite dead yet. Yeah. So just quickly, if we can, um, given that story is the point and at the heart of everything you do, uh, what's up next for you? What are you, are you working on anything new? I think you did say that there was a third yeah. novel. Yeah, Liv, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in that beautiful um, thing where I'm just going to little quiet places across Brisbane and doing the bone structure of this third book. And um, I, I, two weeks ago, I, I had got the chills down my spine. I have this theory that the spine doesn't lie. You know what I mean? Like the brain can tell you fibs and you can, can tell you everything you want to hear, but the spine never lies. And I was just seriously, like not to sound like a wanker, but like just so many stories I want tell like I just feel I feel pretty freed by all our shimmering skies and kind of I just feel like so anxious like I feel like I've just started out you know and just like man I'm so excited to learn more about this stuff and learn more about writing and, and so I just honestly I've just been like never but I'd always like written in notepads and had like I've got stacks of my there's stacks of them in our home like piles of notepads so with ideas and stuff but, but all I've been doing and it's been wonderful. Like a lot of it over COVID too, has just been um, just coming up with like cool stories. And, but the hard part, hard part was landing on the one that is the, that I must tell, you know, and it get, taps into that thing of, well, what's the, what's the one that just should be told. And um, uh, yeah. And I've just found that. And, and I'm trying to like, I'm literally trying to avoid actually saying what um, it's about, but it's, <laughs> it's really about, levels <laughs> human <laughs> levels <laughs> so that's like tells you nothing but i'm i'm keeping this genie in the bottle but it's um you know what it's kind of a mystery actually if i'm gonna it's a mystery i'm gonna i'm writing a mystery but it's totally so much more than that you know so it's um yeah <laughs> but i'm really excited about it and it and it but it's meaningful and it, and it kind of has to be written and and it's from um just looking at the world right now and uh and and but very much um, still my mates in housing commission Brackenridge would be proud of it. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, so it's sort of, yeah, it's something that needs to be told. And, you know, so I'm, if I can do it right, it'll be just, could be something really cool. And, uh, and still just inspired by everything that's sort of just in, in my world. And, um, but kind of, um, yeah, I, I, I saw not, this, the chill down my spine came from this potential twist of this mystery that I, that I got. So I sort of, yeah, I'm excited about seeing if I can get to that point. Yeah. Well, we won't let you spoil it for us. I don't think you want to <laughs> anyway. Um, Trent, I'm really excited for this new novel, Our Shimmering Skies, to finally hit the bookshelves. I know it's been delayed with all yeah. the all the yeah. stuff that's gone on this yeah. year. Um, but Trent, like people just they need this book. Uh, we need we need the um, we need the joy you've got to share. The enthusiasm, the enthusiasm. Oh. You're an enthusiasm enthusiast, and uh, we all we all need that. Um, we all need oh. to look up at the sky more, and we um, we need to seek out uh, the gifts that 
are, are abundant. It's a, it's, it, it sounds man. religious, doesn't it? Oh, it that does. I know. It in, sounds like a, in this book. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And it's not, you know, I know that's it. Hey, it's that sort of, I know. And I, and I, I know I always, you know, I'm on the edge of like a sort of a, like I'm sounding like a bloody hippie or something, but it's like, it's just all just like, you know, couched in this kind of very real sort of stuff, but it's like, yeah. And I mean, like, it's just, I just want to say thanks to you guys because Ben, I remember, you know, months ago with the journey of this thing and it was just you quietly coming up and going like, yeah, man, like on ya, on ya, you know? And, I, and it means a lot. It, le- it means a lot when you do write a book like All Out from the Skies where, you know, I, I just thought, well, you know, why not just go, for, you know, hit for the fence and, you know, it can, it can really, I would imagine it, you don't know where it's going to go. And uh, so I just can't thank you guys enough for just even just giving it the time of day and just, you know, everything you do for Aussie books. It's very cool. And, but it, it is all encouraging. You know what I mean? It, it leads to one thing, you know, it's like Booktopia's supporter, Boyce Wells Universe says to me, Hey man, keep going, go back, write more. And, you know, so it, it, one thing leads to another. So huge thanks to you guys. You're a big part of that size book. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure, Trent, honestly. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you've got us both all excited about this book all over again. Despite the fact we've both already read it. Um, I think our listeners are in for a real treat with this one. So thank you for coming in and, well, not coming in. Thank you for joining us today and having a chat. It's been wonderful. Uh, pleasure. Thank you, guys. And thanks for knowing it so well. It's so cool. I really appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> the best. No worries. Uh, thanks also, Ben. And for our listeners at home, All Our Shimmering Skies by Trent Dalton is out on the 29th of September and you can order your copy from booktopia.com.au. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.